Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Godot OpenVR series. What you see on my screen right now is the excellent sponsor demo made by Hugo Locurcio based on Crytek's sponsor model. This demo showcases a number of the new rendering capabilities of the Godot game engine, such as global illumination and screen space reflections. It also allows you to switch between different quality levels that are increasingly more demanding of the GPU. In this video, we are going to port this demo over to OpenVR. I had originally intended to also showcase the new light mapping in Godot, but I'll do that in a future video. Unfortunately, there was one change in the ARVR server that did not make it into the Beta 2 release. This change has now been merged into the master repository, so you will need to build Godot from source. You will also need to compile the GDNative OpenVR plugin. Once Godot is out of beta, we will make this plugin available through the Asset Store. I will put a full Windows 64-bit build of this project on my Dropbox. The link will be in the description below. To follow along with this tutorial, you will need to download a copy of the Sponza demo from the link shown on screen. You also need to download a copy of the source of the OpenVR GD native plugin, even if you are not compiling this from source. This repository contains support files that we will need. Links to both repositories will be in the description below. I have cloned these two repositories into a folder on my desktop. The Sponza repository is the one we will change over to VR, so let's rename the folder. We then go into the demo folder inside of our OpenVR plugin. Assuming you have compiled the plugin into this folder structure, we will copy over the bin and OVR folder into our Sponza folder. Note that in the bin folder I only have these four files. The Godot OpenVR DLL file that we have built, an OpenVR GDN lib file that informs Godot about our library, the OpenVR API DLL supplied by Valve, and the GDNS file that gives us access to our render models. You may have other files in here left over by the build process that we do not need to use. The OVR folder contains a number of Godot scenes that are handy to get you started. You don't have to use any of these as you can create the logic you want in Godot. We will be using them in our tutorial today, so let's jump into Godot. The first thing we need to do is a little cleanup. There are a few things we no longer need or that we will implement differently in VR. The first of these is our camera, which will be replaced by our VR camera. We also do not want the FPS counter, as none of the 2D components will render correctly. We must also remove our settings, however we will reintroduce this later. Next we go into our project settings. Let's rename our project. We'll leave the quality settings alone for now. You may want to limit some of these if you are on slower hardware, but once we have our settings menu back, it will take care of these. We are going to change our display settings. As we are rendering to our HMD, we do not want to open Godot full screen. We'll also change the default size of the window to something that looks nice enough to start with but the user can choose to resize this later on. VSync was already turned off in the Sponza demo, but this is very important to leave off in VR, as this would limit the frame rate to your monitor, not to your HMD. Let's start adding our VR bits in. We will add a scene called OVR First Person from the OVR folder into our scene. This is a little helper scene on which we'll turn editable children on. We can see that we have our AR VR camera, we have a left hand controller, we have a right hand controller, and we have a HUD spatial node. This is a special node to which you can anchor a GUI which will align itself with the camera. We will use this later on to add our menu back in. 
The next thing we need to do is add a script to our scene root. We are going to put the same code in here that we used in our previous tutorial to enable the OpenVR interface. Note that turning HDR off is still needed. We have not yet found a way to make OpenVR use the HDR buffers. Let's run our project so far. Make sure you are not on the 3D tab in the editor, as otherwise it will render another copy of the scene and slow things down. Note that my screen capture software is also having an effect on my frame rate, causing a bit more jittering. The effect is lost in the recording, as you really have to see this in VR, but the first thing we notice is that the scale is all wrong. We're about the size of a child. Luckily, there is an easy fix for this. Now we could scale everything in our world up, but the ARVR server has a property that allows you to adjust the scale at which things are tracked to the scale of your scene. While this property persists on the ARVR server itself, for convenience we are also displaying the value on our origin node. We will change this value to 0.7, which means that 0.7 units within Godot equal 1 meter in the real world. That looks heaps better. Next, let's have a look at making our controllers do something. We'll start with the same direct movement controls that we had in our previous tutorial. I have however taken a different approach. Inside of our OVR folder you will find a number of scenes that start with the name function. These scenes contain fragments of behavior that you can add to a controller by simply loading up this scene as a child of the controller. Let's add our direct movement function to our right hand controller to enable direct movement on this controller. I've also created a teleport function and we will add this to our left hand controller. I won't go into the code of these in this video, my goal here is to show you how to hit the ground running. I'm also planning a few enhancements as we do not yet check if the player is allowed to move somewhere. We also don't have a mechanism yet for changing the elevation of the player. Let's try this out. Our direct movement is controlled with the thumb pad on the right vibe controller or the joystick on the right touch controller. Our teleport works by pressing the trigger on the left hand controller, aiming and letting go. You can also use the thumb pad or joystick while aiming to change the direction you'll end up facing. The final thing we will do in this video is reintroduce the menu, but within our VR world. I'm not the biggest fan of this approach, as it isn't a natural interface for VR, but it does showcase a method for interacting with the UI. I have prepared the scene for this beforehand, based on the original menu from the Sponza demo. We will have a closer look at the code for this. First we need to add another function to our right hand. This is a generic function that adds a laser pointer to the right hand controller. We'll make it so that this pointer is only enabled when the menu is open. Next we'll add our menu scene as a child node to our HUD anchor point. We'll find this amongst the scenes that are part of the Sponza demo right next to the original menu. We need to hook up the button press signal on the right hand controller to our script to enable hiding and showing the menu. We can't seem to do this in the interface however, because we are working with editable child nodes, but we can easily do this in code. We will edit the script on our root node and add a line that connects the button press signal to our settings menu node. When we look at this function in our settings menu, we will see that it reacts to button 1 which is the menu button on the Vive and the B button on the touch controllers. Most of the code in the settings window has been copied from the original demo. I won't go into detail on that. Do note that all the original button interactions for the 2D UI are still there and those will work. Let's have a look at the changes in our scene. We can see the original menu nodes there, but they are now a child of a viewport. This viewport is a 2D viewport on which our interface is rendered. 
I did make a few small changes to the menu to facilitate VR, such as removing the resolution options and changing some of the text. At the bottom you will find an area node that contains a mesh instance and a collision shape. The mesh instance is simply used to render the viewport on. The collision shape interacts with a ray cast embedded in our laser pointer that provides us with the 3D coordinate where this ray hits our screen. Finally, in our ready function, you will find a line of code that links our viewport to the material on our mesh instance. While there is a viewport texture, there are issues with loading this resource, and the line of code simply works better. On our area node, we find a script that has the code that makes this all work. Our pointer logic will call methods within the script if the ray is hitting our collision shape. In here we are mimicking mouse actions. Our onPointerPressed method is called when the ray is hitting our collision shape and the user presses a trigger. We turn that into a mouse button press action. In our pointer release method, we turn that into a mouse button release action. And our pointer move function is turned into a mouse moved action. At the top, we find an important function that takes the 3D point at which the ray intersects our collision shape applies the inverse transform of our collision shape so we can use the x and y coordinates and transforms that into the screen coordinates on our viewport. There is a margin of error here, but it works very nicely. It is time for a final demo. I have recorded this with Windows own screen recorder instead of OBS, which had smaller effect on my frame rate. I am running this on a laptop, so at the highest quality settings it can get a little choppy. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe. See you next time.